What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? Let's have a fun joke by making up the story in the Bible. We, I think it's safe to say that we actually believe that the people who wrote this stuff actually believe this. But the whole point is that we don't have a whole lot of evidence to say it was actually true. You can believe something and have it not be true. Uh, yeah, you can pretty much deem whether or not it's true based on the fact that these people decided it was okay to be stoned to death and torn apart for what they believed. So obviously it wasn't just some story. That alone is pretty good evidence that it was true. I think one of the biggest things that I saw was just that when he was saying that the logical conclusion is that there is a resurrection because of these facts, but those facts did that's not the logical conclusion because we've never seen the resurre anyone get resurrected or anyone raised from you don't need to see anybody get resurrected from the dead when all of a sudden all of the disciples who went from not really believing and tentative all went to become martyrs and 11 of the 12 died horrible deaths from stoning to being torn apart why would logical rational people who had nothing to lose do this and choose this that's what's illogical well, okay so the, you can't you can't just say oh the scholars agree therefore it's true exactly that's what we're trying to teach you guys every single day with evolution let yet you fall back on the majority of scientists believe it therefore it's obviously true every single time i like the double standard though i found that there's no dispute among scholars that jesus was dead after being crucified <sighs> Ain't that a bitch? Of course you appeal to the authorities. But the fact that they are using their religious bias in order to see these historical facts and use this historical evidence to support these facts, I, I, I feel like you really have to investigate it like for yourself. There you go, one more time. See, you're one step closer to getting it. We're pure indoctrination, going through school five days a week, hours and hours a day, being fed evolution. You're going to be indoctrinated, right? But yet here they are, listening to the authority every time, never actually experimenting or taking the study for themselves. How many times have you been in the field to prove evolution? That's right, never. How many other theories have they taught you when you were in school? Oh, that's right, none. That's true, huh? I may imagine that. Evolution theory is the only one protected by law. You're not going to learn anything else. And if you don't open those books and write down answers from those books, you're going to fail that class. If that's not indoctrination, I don't know what is. Show me one secular historian who says oh. there was an empty tomb. There are none. Okay. There are um, no what secular... About, what, about, what about on Pincus Lapid, the late Jewish New Testament scholar, that said uh, he remained a Jew, but he said on the basis of the evidence... He would believe in the resur he believes in the resurrection of Jesus. He just didn't believe he was the Messiah. That's okay. Uh, well, this, that, uh, Jew no, then that's not be. then that's not a secular historian. Oh, come I'm talking on. about one secular. What about no, Michael but, Grant? Okay, Michael what about Grant Michael is Grant? another one. I, I got all types of quotes from historians, not just new or Christian for, for an empty New tomb. Testament historians. In uh, I believe it was three twenty five. Helena, uh, she went back to Jerusalem and verified where the tomb was uh, what, and, you know, was, was talking and interviewing numerous people. We have every good reason to believe where the tomb is. We, we know where the tomb, the tomb was. Where? It just where? wasn't a celebrated thing. The Holy Spect Spectrica. Hold uh, on, hold on, hold on. Why do, why do quotes from historians talking about what they think about the past? Do you want... If you is want evidence to know, for anything. You hippo. So the guy gives evidence, and now all of a sudden, they're just quotes. I love it. Love the double standard. Love the reasoning. Two is that the Gospels, the narratives about Jesus and what he went through, are indeed independent sources. And he's going to get into sources a little bit later, but... You have to rely on the idea that they were not influenced by 
any other kind of Christian thought that they are direct eyewitness accounts of what happened. And that's simply not the case. If you just look at the timeline for these Gospels, you have Mark being written in 70 AD, and then you have Matthew being written about 80 or 90, and then you have Luke being written even farther down in, in the timeline than that, like 90 uh, uh, AD. And then you've got John that was most likely written in the second century, but could have been written as early as the late 90s of the first century. <laughs> okay. But all you're giving us is an argument from authority, Lee. You hypocrite. So now what you're telling us is that you're appealing to authority. Got it. How ridiculous. You literally just complained about this like one minute ago. Multiple times. Unreal. Uh, the famous atheist New Testament scholar Gerd Ludeman says it's historically indisputable that he was dead. Oh, well, that definitely means that he was dead. Oh, fuck, honey, did you hear that? Garrett Ludeman or whatever the fuck says that he was definitely dead, so I guess that means he's definitely dead. <laughs> okay. Now that we're positive that you have a double standard when it comes to sources, unless, of course, you want to claim that you're the carbon dater for those Levitical scrolls, good luck. Being that Mark was written first, then Matthew, then Luke, and then okay, John. Let Complete fail. The Gospels were written as first-hand accounts. They were all together at the same time, witnessing the events, and they were writing them down as they saw them. So how can one come before the other? It's illogical, and you just don't know any better. How do we know the New Testament documents are written early? There's several reasons. First of all, we know Paul died in 65 or so AD, mid 60s, so he had to have written all of his works before he died. And Luke actually is quoted by Paul. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 5 that a section of Luke is scripture. So he's quoting Luke as scripture, which would of course mean Luke had to have been written earlier. We know there are eyewitness details all over these documents. In Acts, from chapter 13 to 28, there's 84 eyewitness details that only an eyewitness would have known. All these are listed in our book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. In the Gospel of John, there's 59 of these details also listed in I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And then, oh, by the way, there are commentaries early, very early in the second century on the New Testament documents. Obviously, they had to have been written prior to that. and. Ignatius, an early church father, by 110 AD, had quoted from 25 of the 27 New Testament books. So these books must have been written in the first century for Ignatius to have quoted 25 out of 27 of them. And they're much earlier than the so-called Gnostic Gospels, which came about a hundred years later in the late second century. He says that um, none of like, the books written in the Bible were actually by eyewitnesses. Well, we haven't even gotten there yet, but that's just nonsense, and I'll tell you why. In the, say, first of all, the book of Acts. Roman historian Colin Hemmer went through the book of Acts with a fine-tooth comb, and from chapter 13 to chapter 28, he identified 84 details that could only have been eyewitness details. In fact, Craig Blomberg of Denver Seminary went through the entire Gospel of John and found 59 details that were either eyewitness details, historically probable, or historically certain. So I don't know why he would say they weren't eyewitnesses because they include so much data that could be verified to be eyewitnesses. In fact, Sir William Ramsey, who uh, followed Luke, Luke's path around to try and figure out if Luke was telling the truth, started out by saying Luke wasn't accurate, and afterwards he said Luke was an historian of first rank. In fact, he said he named, I can't remember how he put it, something like 54 islands, 32 countries, or 54 something, 32 countries, and nine islands without making a mistake. I can't remember all the particulars here. I mean, Luke, if you, in fact, if you read the book of Acts, you see that Luke goes from describing they did this and they did that to we did this and we did that in, Luke, in Acts chapter 16. Now, Luke wasn't an eyewitness of Jesus, but he was an eyewitness with Paul. And there are numerous eyewitness details throughout the text that could only have been known by eyewitnesses or somebody who knew eyewitnesses. So we, we all have all that in chapters uh, 10, 11, and 12 of I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist.
uh, being that uh, supposedly he was crucified and he died from it. And then his followers afterwards saw, you know, a risen Jesus. Like they build that kind of foundation and then they make the logical leap and say that, oh, that means that Jesus definitely was uh, was uh, risen from the dead. And uh, without any actual evidence to substantiate like a resurrection. And they say that that is more probable than the natural explanations that we have, which if you don't know, miraculous explanations are always going to be far less probable than natural. Probable, sure. Impossible, no. So obviously you admitted that there's room for this. So why would normal people who could have easily said at any point in time, no, I'm not a believer and I'm not a follower, and could have stood up and walked away from these horrible deaths, chose the other, chose the latter? The 20 Where's the tomb, tomb at? Sorry, the empty tomb. Like this, yeah, where is it? Where's the tomb? The, well, they didn't venerate the tomb in the early church because uh, there was because the tomb was empty. The tomb wasn't the most important thing. It was, but where is it? Oh, hang on, hang on. Wouldn't it been a, there, hang on. There is Josh, a tradition. Josh, wait. Wouldn't it have been a wouldn't it have been a holy spot though? You think? I think that hey, yeah. this was a place that that Jesus was buried for a couple of days and rose from the dead. I want to make this into a specific holy place. I would think that that would be something very noted it's, in history. Absolutely not. Not whatsoever. The second commandment is idolatry. You think the Messiah is going to let his disciples venerate a place specifically to worship? Never. Right, so the evidence we have, so my contention always is the most normal thing that happened when someone was crucified, we know this, the most normal thing that happened was they were thrown in a mass grave. There's nothing that you've just presented that is that lends itself one way or the other more than a mass grave and we know that was the normal thing that happened yeah it so, was so, it, it certainly was the normal thing I so why would we thing. why would we imply the abnormal thing you're not looking you're look you're looking at the general historical probability of based on what normally occurred in and uh in, in under the roman empire you're yeah. not looking yeah, at this specific And so Paul evidence. said buried, the, the earliest evidence we have, 1 Corinthians 15, which I don't know where we get this two or three years. To, but anyway, 1 Corinthians 15, earliest part, doesn't say buried in a tomb. It says buried. So why would we, if Paul didn't feel like he needed to make an exception that it was the abnormal thing, why would we not say that it was the normal thing? Like Apologia here seems to think that it's about mass graves, since that is what happened to the average person. Was Jesus average? No. He had disciples, he had followers, and he was very popular as well for what he did, healing the sick and performing miracles. This is why they feared him so much, because of the numbers that he could amass for rebellion. Why was he treated differently after his death? It tells us for a few reasons. One was prophecy. Another was that he was purchased by Joseph. Another was that his followers might steal the body. So many reasons exist as to why he would have been treated very differently and not thrown into a mass grave. So who buried him then? Apologia is only referring to Paul from Acts. But this is only a small part of the story. One must look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Here, let me explain. Acts only mentions the Jews, as where Matthew says that it was Joseph of Arimathea who had the body. Let me explain in order about what happened. Remember this and how close it all ties in soon. Acts 13.29 and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the sepulcher. So the mob are what took him down and put him in the sepulcher. In Matthew 27, 60, it clears this up. He was placed in his own tomb, which had been carved out of a rock. Then he rolled a great stone across the sepulcher entrance and departed. So Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus performed the burial preparations that had normally been performed upon a Jew. This was also mentioned in John 19.41. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in that garden, a new sepulcher. It had never been used before. So here you can see the Jews placed Jesus there for a very short time because the Jews had a preparation day for the Sabbath, and that night was at hand. In Luke 23.53, it tells us, And he took it down, and he wrapped it in linen cloth, and he laid him in the tomb, cut into rock, where no one had been laid before. In Mark 15, 46, it says, Joseph bought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a stone across the entrance of the tomb. 
So here's your answer. As you can see, the mob took him down and placed him in a sepulcher. And then along came Arimathias and Nicodemus, who begged for the body and purchased it and placed it in a custom-made stone sepulcher in a place where no man had been laid before. Guards were stationed there so that the body was not stolen, and a giant stone was placed at the front of the entrance after the burial preparations were finished. So as you can see, there's lots of details about his death and what happened to the body. We don't have to speculate, and we know that he wasn't thrown into a mass grave. There's lots of details from outside sources and biblical sources. Let me give you a rundown of the four Gospels, okay? Mark has the, uh, I believe it's three women, including uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary, mother of James and Joseph, and then Salome. They find the tomb and there's a, a, a boy inside of it and they tell them, oh, hey, the Jesus is risen, go flee. And they left and they didn't tell anybody. Now, then Matthew comes in, and boy, Matthew has an angel descending from heaven, striking the tombstone or the, the cover stone away from the tomb right in front of the women. And then he plops his butt right down on top of the tomb and proclaims Jesus is risen and tells the women to go off and, and whatever. And then okay. the story continues. Okay, so hold on, hold on, hold on. I said, let me give you a rundown of all four gospels. I've only gotten through two of them. Okay, number three, uh, what uh, was it? Two women get to the tomb, and an angel, uh, two angels appear to them and tell them about Jesus. Okay, and then in John, one woman, Mary Magdalene, gets to the tomb and just finds some uh, tattered uh, uh, robes on the ground or whatever, his, his clothes that he was buried in. And then that's it. There was no angel appearance at all. So tell me, how is this four different perspectives the you? same event? Are you drunk? The reason that it makes no sense to Godless Galaxy is because he is taking individual scriptures and reading them and trying to comprehend how it makes any sense. These stories are really easy to understand if you follow the timeline between the books rather than just reading them alone individually from a single person's perspective. Using them all at the same time is how I can unfold the story for you. You would think GE here would have enough common sense to do this on his own if he really was interested in the truth, but I guess that's what a critic does, right? They see something they think is an error or out of place and they can throw it in the face of anyone they despise. Let's answer this now, shall we? Mark 15, 47 says Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were watching where they saw the body was placed. So they knew exactly where it was. It was no secret. I'm sure they told others. During the Passover, even Jesus kept the Sabbath in death. He was resurrected on Sunday, the first day of the week. Visions of angels were seen by women in Luke 24, 23. Some women saw one angel, others saw two. Mark 16, 2. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they went to the tomb. They were asking one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But before their arrival, there was a giant earthquake in which the angel descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it in Matthew 28, 2. Inside the tomb was an angel sitting on the right-hand side, Mark 16, 5, which they saw when they entered. Outside the tomb were two angels standing by those without, Luke 24, 4. When Mary Magdalene returned to the sepulcher alone, she saw two angels seated inside the tomb, one at each end of the body where Jesus was laid, in John 20, 12. You see, not a problem at all. Only uneducated people on the subject, like godless engineer here, who do not investigate whatsoever, find this as a good argument. It's not. So basically, what I can summarize from this, that it's more probable that they had uh, hallucinatory things, like either they they fully believed in this thing, and so they hallucinated Jesus, or maybe they just ate some shrooms, and they read the scriptures too much. Are you drunk? Yeah, excellent question. In fact, some people put forth the hallucination theory as a counter to the resurrection. There's a number of problems with it. One, of course, is the empty tomb. Because easily the hallucination uh, response could have been solved when the Jews just go to their, their own tomb where Jesus' body is and take it out and go, you're hallucinating, here's his body. Even if it was a skeleton by that point, a skeleton would have disproven Christianity because the, the, uh, the, the idea would have been, well, that was Jesus and people would have given it up. Secondly, hallucinations are not group events, right? They're individual events. Like if we were to come in here tomorrow, all of us, and I would stand up here and say, gee, that was a great dream we had last night, wasn't it? <laughs> You'd go, what? What are you talking about? No, hallucinations are individual events. So that wouldn't have explained how you have 12 disciples 
plus the 500 uh, who, are, who saw him all at once. It wouldn't explain a, a, that, that group sighting. It also wouldn't explain all the miracles that were done after Jesus has risen from the dead uh, because he's seen physically. And as you remember in Luke, he's walking along and he, and he says, look, I'm not a ghost. I have flesh and bones. I'm not a ghost. So the hallucination thing really doesn't work. And then I think finally, from a psychological perspective, it's hard to diagnose somebody with hallucinations when they're sitting on your couch. <laughs> but to try and say that somebody's having a hallucination, and many people are having hallucinations 2,000 years ago, when they were not pre predisposed to expect Jesus had risen from the dead. Remember, they weren't expecting him to rise from the dead. They thought it was over. That's why they're so dejected. So it doesn't make any sense. They weren't even psychologically, uh, they weren't even psychologically oriented toward hallucinations. So I don't think any of the evidence points toward hallucinations. Couldn't the appearances of Jesus after his crucifixion have been hallucinations? This has been suggested by a number of critics, but I think there are some insuperable problems with the hallucination hypothesis. Number one, the wide variety of the locations, the circumstances, and the witnesses to these appearances belie the hallucination hypothesis. Jesus was not just seen on one occasion, but on many occasions not just by one individual, but by many persons, not just by single persons, but by actual groups of people, not at one locale and circumstance, but at many different places and under many different circumstances. And this wide variety of circumstances, people, locale, and so forth, I think simply uh, makes the hallucination hypothesis quite improbable. Uh, a second problem with the hallucination hypothesis is that I think we have good grounds for affirming the historical credibility of the gospel accounts of these appearances. And these appearances were clearly physical and bodily appearances. I do not think that you can dismiss this element of the narrative as being merely legendary because it is unanimous throughout the narratives, it's consistent, and also the date of the Gospels is too close to the time of the events recorded to have allowed such a total corruption of non-physical appearances into this consistent and unanimous tradition of physical appearances. So the very physicality of the resurrection appearances, I think, uh, undercuts the hallucination hypothesis. A third problem with the hallucination theory is that I do not think it accounts for why the disciples came to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. You see, the Jewish concept of resurrection differed from the resurrection of Jesus in that the Jewish conception was always a resurrection after the end of the world, at the end of history, and it was always a general resurrection of all the people, never of an isolated individual. But in Jesus' case, you had the resurrection of an isolated individual within history something which was simply unknown in Judaism. The Jewish uh, frame of thought had another category which would have nicely explained hallucinations uh, if the disciples had had them, namely the notion of assumption into heaven or translation into heaven. Certain Old Testament figures such as Enoch and Elijah did not physically die, but were assumed directly into heaven. And this category could be applied to recently deceased persons as well as living ones. So that had the disciples seen hallucinations of Jesus, they would have seen hallucinations of Jesus glorified in Abram's bosom or in paradise. This is where the souls of the righteous dead went to be with God uh, when they died. And seeing hallucinations of Jesus glorified like this would at most have led the disciples to proclaim the assumption or the translation of Jesus into heaven, not his resurrection from the dead, which went decisively contrary to Jewish thinking in at least two fundamental respects. And finally, number four, the hallucination hypothesis says nothing to explain the fact of the empty tomb. You have to conjoin some additional independent hypothesis to the hallucination theory in order to explain the empty tomb. But the single hypothesis of Jesus' resurrection from the dead explains both the appearances and the empty tomb, 
and therefore has greater explanatory scope and simplicity and is therefore the preferred explanation. For, and therefore, for reasons such as these, I think that the hallucination hypothesis is not uh, the best explanation of the evidence. Yes, sir, what's your name? Scott. Scott, go ahead. All right, so uh, I'm not an atheist, and uh, I think you're pretty funny. I enjoyed your presentation. Um, so these questions I'm going to ask, I don't want to have like a debate. I'm just interested. There are questions I thought sure. of uh, as you were speaking. So. I've made up lies to make myself look worse. Um, it's to give others like peace of mind or to make them feel better. Uh, maybe I'm playing like a game with somebody and I play worse, so I will make them have more fun to make the game more fun for everybody. Right, but that would be the exception rather than the rule, right? You wouldn't make up, you, you wouldn't make yourself look bad in a, uh, in a format like the New Testament where you're trying to tell the truth about what happened to Jesus and you wouldn't, I wouldn't think anyway, you wouldn't go forward with suggesting that you were dim-witted and that you ran away while the women were the first witnesses. And, and it just seems to me it would be improbable for any group of people to do that. Well, that's actually my next part. Okay. So there's some people out there who are not homeless, but they pretend they're homeless. Um, and then they lie about who they are and they say, you know, I'm not good at life. This is me on the street because they want to get money from people. That's right. So can you see how other people would lie to make themselves Yeah, lie? but if you look at what the New Testament writers, what did they get out of doing this? In fact, my friend Jay Warner Wallace who's a cold case homicide detective. Um, he and I do some seminars together. You've seen him on Dateline because he's been on Dateline five times solving murders that are decades old. He says when he finds a dead body, there's only three reasons why that body's dead. There's not, you don't walk in and find a dead body and go, oh, there's a thousand reasons this guy's killed. No. There's only three, or a combination thereof. Sex, money, or power, or some combination thereof, okay? Now I ask you, those are the motivations for conspiracies. Sex, money, or power. Did the disciples get chicks by saying this happened? Did they get power by saying it happened? Did they get money by saying it happened? No, in fact, they were thrown out of their lofty position in Judaism, particularly Paul, who was in a very big position of power. He was persecuting the church, and he became persecuted because of it. So he didn't do it, and the apostles didn't appear to do it for any of those normal reasons you do to commit any kind of conspiracy or crime. Yeah, I don't see that as being actual evidence of an <clears throat> empty tomb. The best that you have is, is Paul. Paul doesn't talk strong. about an empty tomb. Paul does not we talk about an empty tomb. Correct your idiocy. You I don't see know. that as being actual evidence of an mm -hmm. empty tomb. The best that you have is is Paul. There, Paul doesn't talk strong. about an empty tomb. Paul does not we talk about an empty tomb. <laughs> <laughs> My biggest pet peeve is when somebody in, in like I hate that. And if uh, the next person to do it, you're getting kicked the fuck out. Let him fit. You hypocrite. Wait a minute. Isn't that you? Wait, where were you when I was trying to talk? Hmm. It's even uh, argues that our, our knowledge uh, of molecular processes wait, wait, is not good enough to ever to rule question. out independent origins. So I it's telling us that there are hello, things of hello. density of hair that they have to protecting them from all elements. They don't wait, get sunburned. Wait, wait, wait. Hold, sunburn on, hold on. Let me know Excuse what you think. Excuse me. Now lost their bees, and now Except they know how to donate by hand. Except that they, they are not. Well, this thing can't do that thing, then that's no, unfalsifiable no, 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 in that science. No, Matt, Matt, well, Matt, well, hold on. Uh, something is a mammal, but if you want to buy they, play they by the exactly taxonomic the same rules, that is very, very control. strong. They have twice as much density. Yeah, they do I have mean, very, very strong really muscles. Information we're talking about, it would have to be some no, no, no. kind of a what cane. Would, then we get have to get it uh, pretty recently. Um, okay, never uh, mind. These, these, these questions. And humans are just no, it's not have outdoor allergies they never fail and they have they, far yeah, better they hearing they have far better yeah, they color do. vision they do have, they have those everything, things things all the time this is genetic breakdown this is deg degradation genomic too. can you explain we're not, we're not powerful jaw look at their immunity they're immune to yeah, they're all, all identical infection. other species as well but when these genes mutate but because that, that, they have if evolution was true, they wouldn't have function because they well, evolved. No, they are well, human beings so I, far I, long ago. They, they, but you can get no, no they, evolution they, at a certain stage. It, it, that's all. We uh, believe all right, in macroevolution. Right, it just his, finishes his, his when book, you know things. Well, no, 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 no. Hang on. 
They're, they're, they're just saying even when they know they're strong. Even they what? say they don't know. And there's too much about? noise at the end what? of these branches. Zero percent no, of what? Clear definition of what a species is. Now you can't blather Okay, on so about stop. It. His videos constantly say. I know, Kent Hovind lies again. The longer they spend their time what? in the ocean, the less they need to shell. turtle? Well, the turtle. It's still a turtle. Yeah, we, the how many species of turtles? Do you have any idea how many species? Whoa, 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 whoa. Something like that. I, I think they're understanding a macro evolution is a new morphological feature. Straw man. It's a straw man distortion of. By 99.9%. .9%. What are the odds, are the that, odds? Uh, that human okay, beings have to We're not going to do this. It even uh, argues that our, our knowledge uh, of molecular processes wait, wait, is not I good enough to ever determine or rule out independent origins. So I it's telling us that. Hello? Things hello? How about each other? Will they interrupt each other when they talk? Let's see. And they are in the, what he would say, cloak with the groupage. And they could be monophyletic or para. Oh, wow. Look at that. Respectful. Amazing. Watch some more, shall we? All right, Aaron. Um, well, what, once again. You... No, no. I just, it, I always have a good time. It's really, it, it, the explanation is boring. Shannon would be really good to do it with something with that along, along those lines. Maybe. Um, ten, ten if you're old like me. Be awesome. Uh, and then, of course, and guys, after sure. that. Weekend after that, I'll be back and so will you admit Matt, listen very carefully. That would be pre Cambrian. Okay. Uh, and I have I'm gonna send this to I'm gonna send this and to those David, are, um, those are... Unknown, so that we can see this on the screen and um Monkey uh, Drunk. I, I feel like this is gonna, I feel like this is gonna replace the Sphinx guy. That thing. Um, can, 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 Go ahead. I'm uh, sorry. Can you, uh, can you can you answer that about the bat um apply to the same clay? Yes. The colloquial so, word so, ape conforms so, to so we're, we're, the taxonomic superfamily hominoidea, which means ape. And we're hominoidea. 